another day, another vulnerability in an internet of things stack. Another router is victim to a remote code execution vulnerability. But the reason why I found this one so interesting was that this is actually a cloud connected device. Typically the routers you see getting hacked with zero day vulnerabilities are ones that sit in your home office or maybe your mom's office, right? You know, a, a small $30 router, like a TP-Link or a Netgear that there's a buffer overflow in the device. Uh, but Team 82 found an extremely interesting set of vulnerabilities, right? There are multiple vulnerabilities that when you chain them together, allows you to execute a command on any cloud connected Ruji device. Now, if you don't know who I am, my name is Ed. I run this channel. I've been doing offensive security, so hacking more or less uh, for the last 10 or so years. I'm a security engineer now. And I find bugs like this super interesting because it begs the question, is this a convenient set of vulnerabilities that were left in the software by accident? Or is this a back door where the back door is the knowledge of each vulnerability staged together? So let's go through Team 82's research. Again, they did a great write up here. I highly recommend. I'll link this down in the video below um, or in the description below. Please go check out the write up by Team 82. Um, I want to kind of give you the, the higher level things that they're talking about here. So as mentioned before, what is Ruji Networks? Uh, Ruji Networks is a company specializing in network infrastructure products for enterprises, educational institutions, government organizations, and service providers. This is like, you know, your traditional cloud enabled IOT network infrastructure, right? So if you go to an airport, if you go to a hotel, uh, you may encounter brands like Cisco Meraki or America. I'm not really actually sure how to, how to pronounce that. Uh, but Ruji is just another one of these devices. I think Microtech is also another good one. Uh, maybe also Ruckus is another one that's out there. Um, but these devices, the idea is that you plug them in and you give internet access to a place that you're working in. So the example they give here is these devices sit at airports. The idea is you can broadcast a Wi-Fi network to an airport and then one security operation center in some location, maybe not even at the airport, can manage it. And how do they use this or how do they do that? They do it through some kind of cloud infrastructure, right? Some kind of network that actually remotely controls the Ruji hardware and then the SOC can tap into that cloud and control the hardware from there. So it gives the ability to manage the devices a little more ease than if they had to run the entire SOC locally, right? Now what they're doing here is something called WAN to LAN vulnerability research. So when you're doing uh, X exploitation of routers, right? Typically there's this issue where you have either NAT, so that's network addre address translation, which is basically the traffic coming into the network has a different IP address than the traffic on the inside of the network, or there's some kind of firewall, right? So the golden ticket for doing vulnerability research on a router is can you, from the WAN side, the wide access network side, the public internet, can you jump the firewall and get code execution on the router itself, which would then allow you to pivot into the network. And even worse, could you, from the internet, get access to a Rouge AP, right, an access point? Because the router is just managing all the devices on the layer three area, right? Like the layer three of the network where the IP addresses are set. Uh, Rouge APs are broadcasting the layer two, layer one of the network. So can you get access to all of these things? Typically, it'd be very hard to find a vulnerability in the network address translation software or the firewall itself. Uh, typically with routers like this, they are going to be like the traditional uh, Linux UFW or the Linux TCP IP stack that are all very heavily, highly audited. And to find a vulnerability in this and that stack of software would be like ungodly. It'd be like the craziest bug of all the days, right? So because of that, Team 82 decided to focus on the Ruji cloud, which again is the place where all of the access points check in to be controlled remotely. This is intentional, this is not a bug, this is a feature. Uh, they check in so that other places or other people can control the devices as a you know, security operations center would. And so they, they found some interesting features, You know, one of them being that the device, when it comes online, it is provisioned, so it calls out to the Ruji cloud and says, hi, my name is Access Point. Once the device is connected to a network, it will try to initiate a provisioning process to Ruji's cloud systems. It begins with sending a serial number to the cloud. Sounds pretty simple, sounds pretty straightforward. Nothing crazy going on there. Hello, I am security number X, bada bing, bada boom. Now Ruji can, can do what it has to do, right? Now, obviously when you're doing any kind of software reverse engineering or vulnerability research on these devices, you are going to need a piece of firmware. Now, what you can do is you can go download the firmware from the manufacturer website. This is actually done intentionally so that if you end up either bricking your device or you wanna upgrade the firmware and it doesn't have an automatic firmware upgrade feature, uh, you can just go download the firmware and then use that to do your vulnerability research, right? Because the firmware is going to be contained 
or the software that runs on the device is going to be contained in that firmware blob. Now we'll zoom in here and I wanna show you guys, you can see uh, there's this little thing called an entropy graph, right? So when vulnerability researchers do uh, a bin walk, which effectively is the attempt at expanding the firmware to reveal all the code inside of it, you do this thing called an entropy analysis. Now, typically when the entropy is very high like this, right? Talking like almost 100% entropy, which means that it's very random in its data. Uh, that means that the firmware is unfortunately encrypted, you know, fortunately for Ruji, unfortunately for the security researchers. Hey guys, real quick, I wanna talk about my course website, Low Level Academy. Whether you're a hacker or a programmer, I think it is extremely important to know how computers work at a fundamental level, all of my courses are designed to do this, whether it's zero to hero C programming, where I teach you how to code the language of C, or how to write network code in C, or even threaded applications in C, or even a little bit of ARM assembly on top of it. You can go try them out now for free with our free preview lessons. And then if you wanna go sign up, I highly recommend you do it soon because our new year sale is ending at the end of the month, and then we are changing our pricing model substantially. You can't hack computers and you can't write good code without knowing how computers work at a fundamental level. And where do you learn that? At Low Level Academy. Okay, thank you for watching. Continue the video. So they have to go and eventually find another vulnerability on the device that they actually don't disclose in this write-up, just maybe because they don't want to like either deal with patching or maybe, maybe it's unnecessary. But either way, to get access to the firmware, they need to take a physical device and just guess at finding a vulnerability to get onto the device in order to find the key. And so, since we already bought a device, we tried to gain a shell access through a vulnerability on one of the landside listening services. One RCE vulnerability later, in a few minutes of searching the device system for firmware, decryption binary netted us the following binary. So RG upgrade crypto. So what happened here is they have the device, they exploited an old vulnerability onto the device. They now have a shell on the device and they can use this shell to figure out, okay, what are the keys for the firmware? Because they wanted to decrypt the newest version of the firmware and find new vulnerabilities, right? And so by doing some vulnerability analysis on the RG upgrade crypto uh, binary, which obviously like just by name, sounds like it will contain some keys, uh, they found this little magical string here, which is then used to create an encryption key, and they were able to successfully decrypt the firmware. So very cool. So they exploited the devices, they were able to get onto the device, and now they have access to all the new code. They are trying to figure out how can we exploit on to another access point by attacking the cloud infrastructure of Ruji, right? So they're trying to figure out how does this device communicate to the cloud. What binaries on this device are used to talk up to the cloud infrastructure? So after gaining access to the firmware, our next step was to understand how devices connect and communicate with Ruji's cloud services. To do that, the first step is always to identify the binary used to communicate with the cloud. To locate this binary, use a couple different approaches, and eventually they found this binary here, mqlink.elf, which uses MQTT, it's a message queuing protocol, also known as a Mosquito. It's a way of basically, uh, you know, in queuing messages and sending them up to a place that is ready for those messages and reading them off sequentially and then processing those messages based on whatever your code does. It's just a very simple way of getting data from point A to point B. And so they did a little, little strings operation here, you know, the, the common toolkit of their vulnerability researcher, and they found, okay, so the MQ link elf is using Mosquito to do MQTT, to do message queuing. Uh, and so, okay, that's probably going to be the one that we have to use. They go through a bunch of the nitty gritty of how MQTT works here, but they found basically, okay, this is definitely how we talk to the cloud because this URL is talking on this port and pushing the data up to the Ruji cloud. So probably all of the message brokering up to the Ruji cloud, the way you would communicate and control the access point is happening in this binary. Now, the message queue system, MQTT, is a really, really important place to get authentication right. If you don't have authentication done correctly, people can publish messages arbitrarily to your message queue, and that's not necessarily a good thing. You don't want that, right? So there's kind of two ways you could do this. Uh, you could have a just password, a flat out password that gives you access to the message queue. But the problem with that is if you, like these people, like Team82 did, if you crack the firmware and you get the password, now everybody has access to the queue. Okay, so another way to do this is to do per access point certificate authorization, right? So you maybe you could do something uh, where every access point has a private key. The private key is used to authenticate the connection. On the cloud side, the cloud has the cert that, sh that verifies against the private key, and you use that to authenticate with who is actually talking to you. Uh, that would be one way to do it. 
but there is unfortunately a worse way that uh, Ruji decided to come up with. So the first bug here is breaking the MQTT authentication, and I'll read their paragraph to give them the full credit and, and their explanation, right? So we moved on to understand how devices authenticate to the MQTT broker. The two main schemes for MQTT authentication are either a user, username and password pair or a client certificate, MTLS. I just ex explained that, right? You authenticate with the server, a server authenticates with you, you make a mutual TLS connection, and you're good to go. <laughs> After a short look at the binary, we discovered that in Ruji's case, the username password pair is used. Not great. Now, again, if they were to give every access point a unique password, that would be okay, right? We could we could get away with this. It isn't the safest thing to do. Certs are better, but I, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. Okay. After a short reverse engineering session, we understood the credential process in the following routine. They take the serial number of the device, they reverse it, and then they SHA-256 the serial number. Serial number, reverse, SHA-256, MQTT password. Which, if you're not shocked by that, you should be. Because, generally speaking, um, the serial number of a device should not be assumed to be a private piece of information. The reason for this is, one, the, the general consumer, the general person who's buying devices, is not going to treat this with any sense of security. I would, because I'm a paranoid freak, and I've seen bugs like this in the past with other device brands, um, but it's just, it's not a good place to have uh, to have a password, right? The password should truly just be random generated string that is not detectable by seed, right? And so, at this point, we've created an initial insane security vulnerability. If anybody knows the serial number of your device, you can authenticate to the message queue as that device. Okay, and as this guy, as these people here are, are mentioning in the in the the, the write up, YouTube, there are plenty of videos of people debugging the the Ruji or the Rai E access points and just giving away the serial number because again, they don't treat that as a piece of sensitive information. So after having access to a serial number, we implemented a simple Python script to connect the Ruji's MQTT broker and at work to give us the ability to authenticate as a device to the MQTT broker. So they're able to authenticate to the queue just having knowledge of their device's serial number and maybe other devices. You're kind of probably getting where this is going here. So they go down a little bit of a rabbit hole here. They break down the uh, the architecture of the topics. Uh, typically, uh, MQTT or other message passing queues are done in pub-sub architecture. When you publish, you publish to a particular topic. The topic describes what you're doing, right? So this is, for example, you know, cloud sync is one topic, cloud config change, event, whatever, right? There are a bunch of different topics. Um, now, eventually, you know, they figure out that they can impersonate a device and DOS it by, you know, telling the Ruji cloud that it wants to disconnect or telling the Ruji cloud that it wants to, uh, you know, fake victim data. It wants to put bad data up there, right? But can they get remote code execution? Because remember, the whole point of this is from anywhere outside of the cloud on the internet, can we get onto an access point that is behind a natted firewall? We're, we're close. And this becomes the holy grail. RCE on all cloud connected devices. So they were doing what any good vulnerability researcher would, would do, right? They were checking, you know, what what commands are sent up to the Ruji access points, right? When they're watching the the, the, the topic information go up to a particular uh, access point, you know, when they're talking to the cloud, they see this one little string here, right? Dev config get module flow control UDP. It's just it's just basically querying the device to get a particular uh, piece of config information out of the device. But the researchers here noted that, hey man, this is just a command. This is just an OS command. Can we publish to an access point netcat execute bin bash to IP port, which is effectively a, re a reverse shell, right? This is the command that gets you access to, the, like it gives you a shell on the device. And so it, it worked, right? They were able to get a shell on this device. But here is the piece de resistance. I don't speak French, I don't know if that's correct, but here is where it gets absolutely incredible. This is where it all comes together. So don't forget, where are we so far? A bug that allows us to authenticate to the cloud with knowledge of the serial number. Okay, now also, vulnerability that allows us to run an arbitrary command on the device given authentication. Okay, so what is the chain here? Know the, know the serial number, run a command. Okay, one more bug. The access points just fucking broadcast their serial number in plain text everywhere. They, like literally, unauthenticated, unauthenticated management frames, they 
they broadcast their serial numbers, okay? So what this means is if you go to the airport and you have a Wi-Fi sniffer, and again, this is not illegal because they are broadcast management frames. They are literally destined for everybody intentional. They are BSSID advertisements, okay? They are advertising in those frames the serial number. So you are able to take that serial number, you are able to bypass the authentication directly to the cloud, and then exploit the vulnerability that gives you a shell on any device in the world. And not just a shell, you could run arbitrary commands here. You could download your malware. You could tell the device to go brick itself, rmtechrf slash sync done. It doesn't work for embedded devices that way, but that's not the point. Um, <laughs> It's just, it's crazy. And so the, the whole point of this, again, they did very good research and it, it's a crazy chain of bugs. My, my question for the class is, when you have a series of bugs like this, now I know the saying is, never mark up to malice, but you can also call incompetence. I, I phrase that, that poorly. But what I'm trying to say is, is this just a cool vulnerability or is this a set of bugs that were placed intentionally that gave this company remote access to any device. And again, I know what you're saying is like, oh, well, the company already manages the infrastructure, so they already had access to these devices. Okay, but if they wanted to potentially sell this access to another nation state where the country is headquartered, for example, um, they could also do that. So that's pretty cool. Anyway, hey, my name is Ed. I do security research. If you like that kind of stuff or just want to hang out, hit that sub button. I really appreciate it. And then go check out this video, video about another cool bug that I think you will also enjoy. Thanks for hanging out. Goodbye.